Howdy readers, I'm Jason, this is chapter and verse, and uh, and this is my weekly ramble, coming a good, I don't know, 24 hours late or something like this from when I would ordinarily have it up, but um, the reason I am doing it tonight um, instead of last night, I was having a difficult time kind of getting my thoughts together uh, on specifically what I wanted to say, not so much about my reading or my, uh, movie watching over the last week, but, um, something else related to, to booktube. So as many of you know, <clears throat> there has been in the last week or so on booktube, some really great, uh, conversation in videos and in comments fields, um, about the phenomenon of commenting right um my wife kelly uh over her channel books i'm not reading uh, made a video on the comments section and then steve donahue made a response video to her video and there's just been a lot of great um useful chatter i feel like about um you know what commenting is what it can lead to um good and bad um what it should look like, uh, what is the etiquette of commenting. And, um, and I wasn't going to talk about this uh, in my ramble until uh, late Saturday night, I got a comment on one of my recent videos from an asshole who um, had left comments on my videos in the past just a few times. And I hadn't seen him in a long time. And, uh, and he'd never really said anything that was, you know, out of line or anything like that in the past. Uh, but he just left a comment on one of my videos. Um, it was just a derogatory, um, body shaming remark about the weight that I've gained. Um, much of which has come in the last year, uh, owing in large part to the pandemic and, you know, me having to work from home and be at home all the time and just not move around as much and eating more, stress eating, drinking more, et cetera, et cetera. However, regardless of why I may have gained weight uh, since starting this channel, it's nobody's place to shame me for having gained weight, okay? It's nobody's place. Whatever my reasons are, whatever the circumstances have been, and I know that, um, that female booktubers encounter this a lot more than men do, um, certainly a lot more than, than you know, old guys like me, where they have people in the comments fields uh, body shaming them or harassing them in some way. And I've always felt really bad uh, for the women on booktube who have had to put up with shit like that, right? And, um, you know, they do, from what I've seen, they do a really good job of it, right? Putting these shitheads in their place, giving back as good as they've been given, et cetera, et cetera, better. Um, and, uh, you know, and blocking these people. <clears throat> and that's, I mean, that's basically what you've got to do. You know, so I deleted the comments immediately and blocked the guy so he can never leave another comment on my channel. Um, so if you're watching, you know who you are. One of the things that bothered me so much about this was that comments like that beneath videos could dissuade someone who's thinking of making a channel um, from doing just that, right? Because they're like, oh my God, I thought this was a... A nice place, you know, booktube, I thought this was a nice place that it was unlike, you know, these other social media platforms that can be really toxic, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to put myself out there um, and risk being ridiculed or made fun of. And, um, and to those people who, again, who might find themselves wary about starting a channel, something that they've been wanting to do for some time, um, might find themselves wary about it because of comments like that left by pricks like this guy. You know, I just want to say, start your channel, right? Booktube is a wonderful, welcoming place. But any comments you get from people that are um, of a harassing nature, you just put them in their place and you block them. I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, that there are those kind of comments as well, right? There are people who um, not only have no sense of etiquette, they have no sense of boundaries, they have no sense of propriety, and, um, and these people don't belong on platforms like this. They just don't. I may have been 
born uh, in Wyoming and raised in a trailer park, but I wasn't born in a barn. And I know what is and what is not okay to say to people. If there's any good to have come from this at all, I suppose, it is that, um, yeah, I have renewed my plan to um, get my weight back down, right? Uh, you know, I can't, I can't kind of continue on in the way that I have. And I've known that for a long time, but for those of you who have struggled with weight, you know how difficult it can be to, to get a handle on that and to continue kind of moving in the right direction or to uh, reverse course when you're moving in the wrong direction. Uh, it's not an easy thing. You know, my weight has gone up and down and up and down my whole adult life, uh, sometimes dramatically. So, um, so I weighed um, yesterday, I weighed, and, uh, and next week I will let you guys know how many pounds I'm down or how many pounds I'm up. And I will check in with you uh, every week when I do these rambles um, so that you can help um, keep me accountable and help encourage me um, because I need that just like anybody else who's struggling with their weight. Um, we need to be encouraged and kind of buttressed up and uh, don't, don't feel like you need to, uh, you know, give me pep talks or anything like that, but, uh, but it's more for me. Right? It's more for me, a way for me to kind of help hold myself accountable to all of you um, and to myself. So, so anyway, yeah, I weighed yesterday and I will let you know um, how much I've gone up or down uh, next week when we, when we sit here with the yarn and talk about books and movies uh, once again. So speaking of books, I'm still reading Mrs. Dalloway. I'm almost done. I'm just over three quarters of the way done. And, um, and I just find it really, really remarkable. Now, one of the things that uh, I'm buddy reading this with um, Sina, uh, who is a frequent commenter here on BookTube, and Mark Nash. Um, and one of the things that we've been talking about on Boxer with respect to this book is how there's this, there's this tension between the scenes in the book that are kind of static and quiet and um, don't exhibit at least outwardly that kind of dynamism that you find elsewhere in the book uh, in this in the scenes where, where characters are kind of bustling or moving or in our in our um, conversation on Boxer we talked about how the static scenes uh, somehow make the dynamic scenes more dynamic but then the reverse is is true as well as Mark Nash pointed out that those dynamic scenes tend to make um, the, the kind of quieter, uh, more inward um, moments feel more stifling somehow. And in thinking about all of this, um, it occurred to me that, that what I like most about the shifting consciousness in this book, right? The way in which Virginia Woolf moves in and out of the minds and the concerns of her various characters. Um, and the way in which those characters are tied together by the things that they um, individually hear or see, right? A, a plane flying through the sky, right? These, these different characters in different parts of the city who have no connection to each other in the moment. They're not together. They're separated by blocks or even miles. Um, they see the same plane in the sky. Or they all hear the same striking of the bell in Big Ben. Um, the striking of the hour or the half hour. Um, it feels omniscient to me. You know, you know, and it's interesting, right? Because I had talked before about how the novel feels kind of cosmic in some way. It also feels, um, I don't know, a little bit like Virginia Woolf is giving us the perspective of God. Now, I know that Virginia Woolf is not intentionally doing that. She's not making some kind of... Um, you know, faith-based or religious commentary. Uh, as far as I understand, she was not a religious uh, woman in any way, shape, or form, um, and neither is her protagonist, Mrs. Dalloway. But, um, you know, the fact that we're privy to the thoughts and the fears and the anxieties and the longings and um, the despair and the hope of all of these different characters um, you know, and there are lots of books that give that to us, but the fact that she connects them through these, um, in the, these kind of third party sights or these third party sounds with the plane and the, the striking of the bell, et cetera, et cetera, it feels kind of divinely encompassing 
in a strange way. Given how similar so much of this feels to Walt Whitman's poetry, and Whitman's poetry had that kind of cosmic sense as well, it feels more like she has a kind of a kind of grand vision of, uh, of humanity. The novel takes place in a single day. Um, and so much of this book is about quotidian life, right? The kind of details in life that, uh, that not only novelists don't, don't tend to um, pay any attention to, but, uh, but, but, you know, those of us, even in the midst of living those details, we tend not to notice them either. And so the fact that she is giving us a single day in the lives of these people and, uh, and that none of them are remarkable in any way, really. Um, and yet it feels somehow so vast and, and so profound. It's quickly becoming a favorite book of mine. Um, yeah, I mean, there's lots and lots of stuff I marked for the beauty of it. Um, but, uh, but one thing I wanted to, to point out, right? So again, like, you know, part of, part of the similarity that this, that this novel has with Walt Whitman's poetry is that both Whitman and Wolf um, have this this knack for or this interest in inventory? But there was one passage in this that reminded me of in the way it was structured and the way it sounds. That reminded me of inventorying in uh, the work of another writer, uh, William Shakespeare. So, so the sentence or the the couple of sentences here, Mrs. Dalloway. Um, See, go like this, right? Uh, so I'll read the, the, the sentence that kind of introduces the inventory and then the inventory itself. <sighs> Some arid matron made her rounds at dawn, sniffing, peering, causing blue-nosed maids to scour for all the world as if the next visitor were a joint of meat to be served on a perfectly clean platter. For sleep, one bed. For sitting in, one armchair. For cleaning one's teeth and shaving one's chin, one tumbler, one looking glass, books, letters, dressing gown, slipped about on the impersonality of the horsehair, like incongruous impertinences. All right, and uh, when I read that, it immediately reminded me of this moment in Shakespeare's uh, Twelfth Night. And, uh, and this is Olivia talking. Oh, sir, I will not be so hard-hearted. I will give out diverse schedules of my beauty. It shall be inventoried, and every particle and utensil labeled to my will as item, two lips, indifferent red, item, two gray eyes with lids to them, item, one neck, one chin, and so forth, were you sent hither to praise me. And, um, you know, when I was talking to Kelly about, um, about that passage and, you know, and again, Virginia Woolf's just habit for or obsession with uh, inventory in her work, Kelly brought up a good point. Um, you know, Steve Donahue made a video quite some time ago about uh, the tenets of, of Dubroism, right? And that Dubro writers, they often inventory things instead of describing them, but it's a stand-in for descriptive prose. And, uh, and so, so Kelly and I were just laughing about how, um, I don't know, right? Does that make Virginia Woolf dude bro? As far as my movie watching goes, right? My film journal. Um, how many films did I watch since last we talked? So I have watched one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight films in the last week. Um... And let's see, one, two, three, four, five of them were rewatches. The films that I saw for the first time this last week were Light of My Life, directed by Casey Affleck, which I loved. A documentary uh, called In Search of Kunden with Martin Scorsese, which was filmed as Scorsese was filming Kunden. And, uh, you know, I don't know how the whole thing sort of played out or how it worked. But uh, but this this documentarian was essentially um, it looks like invited to tag along on the shoot uh, for Kunden and kind of just document the process of shooting um, Kunden and uh, and it was it was interesting I mean it wasn't a particularly well done documentary um, it wasn't particularly artful 
but it was really, really interesting and illuminating. Um, but the film that I wanted to say a few words about, really, really talk about for a few minutes, is uh, 22 July, directed by Paul Greengrass. And this is a film that is about the terrorist attacks in Norway, and I believe it was 2011, where a right-wing uh, radical uh, set off a bomb um, outside a government building in Oslo, and then traveled uh, quite some distance to an island uh, where there was a youth camp. I think all told between um, victims in the bombing and um, and people that he killed on the island, right? And he just hunted them down with a, with a rifle and a scope. Uh, he killed almost 80 people. And 22 July is, I don't know why, it's a movie that nobody talked about. It seemed like nobody talked about it the year it came out and nobody's really talked about it since then. It seems more relevant to me now than ever um, just because since its release, and it came out, I want to say three or four years ago, since its release, um, right-wing extremism just continues to grow um, in the world, in Europe, here in America. Um, you know, it is more and more a threat. And I've read some reviews of 22 July, and there are some critics who felt like it was exploitative, who felt like the film did the survivors of the um the attacks and as well as the memories of the people who died in the attacks a disservice by somehow telling uh, the story of the terrorists as well in the movie but to my mind what the film does okay so it gives us the kind of lead up to the attacks and then the attacks which are just filmed in such a harrowing um, kind of herky-jerky um, documentary-like way, then most of the film actually is about the aftermath of the events. And um, so we see the arrest of the guy, and we see the trial, and we see um, uh, the recovery. So it focuses uh, in large part on one of the victims, right? A young man who was shot five times and, uh, and his physical and emotional recovery through the process leading up to the trial, um, and then at the trial itself. And one of the things I admire so much about the film is how it becomes a study in the difference between justice and vengeance. It is very much a film about how a community needs to not let itself be governed by its emotions. Um, that we need to be governed by reason and we need to be governed by, uh, by thoroughness and by patience and by justice rather than vengeance. Um, you know, and I, I suppose it's a fine line on some level, those things. Um, you know, the, 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 the space between uh, vengeance and justice. Um, you know, I often, uh, you know, talk to, to, to people in the past, especially when I was teaching, I would talk to students about the difference between reacting to something and responding to something um you know i think i think too often those get conflated in people's minds but they're so different there's such an important distinction between the two of them and i think vengeance is much more in line with reaction um than with response uh and then you know conversely i feel like justice is is much more about um measured response to something uh, rather than um, seeking revenge in some kind of way. What do we do when atrocities like this happen and we're left kind of unmoored as uh, a society and as individuals, as families, as, as communities, right? We're left, we're left unmoored and we're left uh, terrified and we're left um, uncertain. You know, our inclination, I think, is to, uh, um, to kind of wall ourselves away, you know, and lash out. But instead, like the, the important thing is to to compose ourselves and to look um, clearly and rationally and um, methodically at what has happened, what needs to happen uh, in response to to uh, to events like this, and uh, and how do we go about it? Right? How can we come together again to to address this and um, to avert? similar things in the future and to make sure that our punishment uh of the perpetrator of these crimes is um is brought to justice rather than brought low by vengeance 
yeah, it's it's uh, it's a complicated question, and I feel like the film does a really good job of addressing it, and it doesn't really provide us too much in the way of answers, right? It just insists that, um, you know, that knitting ourselves back together after we've been torn apart uh, from one another, um, it's imperative, right? It's absolutely necessary. So. So anyway, again, the film's called 22 July. It's a Netflix original. Uh, so if you've got Netflix, it's there waiting for you. Anyway, you guys, if you uh, have seen 22 July, let me know what you thought of it in the comments. And, uh, and let me know as well if you've read Mrs. Dalloway and um, what you think about my idea that, uh, that there's some kind of, I don't know, some kind of divine omniscience at work in the book. And um, yeah, or if I'm just crazy, because maybe I am. I will talk to you all again very soon. Adios.